On This Week in Baseball, an unlikely hero leads the American League All-Stars to victory. All-Star legends play ball. Johnny Biscuit Pickett. Good. How do you feel, young man? I'm on your bag. What's your name? Very lucky. 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 And a first half review that's really out of sight. So don't go away. Once and for all, it's time for This Week in Baseball. Baseball. I was born here, right close to Crosby Field. I was a Reds fan when I was a kid, and I'll be a Reds fan when I'm an old man. And uh, it's just something that's in your blood, and I think there's many, many people in this town uh, that feel the same way about the Reds uh, that I do. The love affair between baseball and the city of Cincinnati dates back more than a century. With the game such a big part of our heritage, what better way for Cincinnati to celebrate her 200th birthday than to host baseball's 59th All-Star Game? After all, this is where professional baseball began and where some of the greatest talents played the game. Ever since the late 1850s, baseball has played a major role in the history of Cincinnati. Then the game was played in an unorganized fashion by the elite youth of the city, one of whom, William Howard Taft, later became president of the United States. The Cincinnati Baseball Club was founded in 1866, and in two years, four of the so-called first nine were paid professionals. A year later, Henry Ellard funded the first fully professional team, whose leaders were Harry Wright, the team's founder and manager, and his younger brother, George, who became the Reds' first star. The team played its home games at the Lincoln Park grounds, and in their first season, the now-paid professionals did not lose a single game. But success didn't last and it would be 50 years before the Reds got into the World Series. Then, in 1919, they capped off their first pennant by beating the seemingly unbeatable White Sox to win the World Series. The win, though, was tainted by the Black Sox scandal, as several Chicago players were later accused of throwing the series. The Reds threw baseball into the future 16 years later when they installed lights at Crosley Field, now their home, and on May 24, 1935, played the first big league night game. Another first for Reds fans came in 1938 when Crosley Field played host to the first all-star game in Cincinnati. The Reds' own Johnny Vandermeer started the game less than one month after pitching back-to-back no-hitters. In 1953, Crosley Field again hosted the All-Star Game, but this would be the last time all of baseball would gather at the ballpark that had inspired so many memories. In 1970, Crosley came under the wrecking ball, and the park that had been home to the Reds for more than half a century became a memory. One of the things that stood out most about Crosley Field was the terrace. Uh, as you know, it ran all the way around the ballpark, and we watched a lot of individuals uh, get embarrassed uh, by the terrace. It had a little hill in left field, and I can remember uh, the, getting the rookies in from the other teams and coming out there, and they'd go back to on a fly ball, and that, that hill would suck them up every time they'd fall down, and the ball would fall from the base head. People were right down close uh, on the field there, and you walk by, you're playing catch along, warming up along the sidelines, or you can carry on the conversations. I think there was more intimacy between the fans and the and the ball players. Back then, you got to know them, and a lot of my good friends are people that I met in Crosley Field. Reds fans would have something to remember Crosley Field by when the team transported home play to Cincinnati's new quarters, a plush $48 million home on the banks of the Ohio River. Just two weeks after Riverfront Stadium opened, the Reds gave a housewarming party hosting the 1970 All-Star Game. The game featured one of the most famous base running plays ever, when Pete Rose crashed into Ray Fossey to score the winning run in the 12th inning. I was the type of player that liked the respect of my peers. And I know that as I was standing at home plate, one thing that was going through my mind was that I didn't want to give the Olay shot, the Matador, try to catch the ball, Olay, get out of the way. 
avoid getting hurt. I did start to slide, uh, but he was up in front of the plate, up the line, blocking the plate, and I was watching the ball, concentrating on the ball. I had no idea where he was in running. I was reaching for the ball, and he hit me. I did start to slide, but he left me no recourse because there was no place to slide. Because if I slide, I'm not going to make the plate, and there's no sense in ever sliding into a bag if you can't get the bag. I, to this day, don't believe that he had any intention of wanting to run over me. Pete is just, that's his style, that was my style, and I just think it was two players and a particular style of play that collided. It seems that that play is going to go down as one of the top plays in All-Star history. Oddly enough, the night before the incident, Fosse and Cleveland teammate Sam McDowell spent the evening with Rose. Sam and I were talking, and he ran into Pete, introduced me to Pete, and he said, what are you doing? after this function. Said nothing. Said, well, we go to dinner. And so we had dinner, and the wives were talking, and Sam and Pete and I were talking, and, and when that was over, uh, Pete said, why don't you come back to the house? And they stayed in my house till about 3 o'clock in the morning, talking baseball at Pete's house. Of course, baseball fans are still talking about the famous all-star collision of July 14, 1970. Now, 18 years later, the All-Star Game returns to Cincinnati's Riverfront Stadium. So stand by for pomp, pageantry, and of course, the game itself. But first, it's time for this week's quiz, brought to you by Chevrolet. The Cardinals' Ozzie Smith, this year's top vote-getter, started his sixth straight All-Star Game. What shortstop has started the most? big part of your life in Cincinnati. Everybody's associated with mom, dad, kids. Everybody's associated with it. It's kind of like playing almost in your hometown. Everybody knows you. You know everybody else. For the baseball legends who gathered at the equitable old-timers game before the All-Star game, it seemed like old times. Yeah, that's the only reason I came here to see you. Yeah, I came to see you. <laughs> it may have been 95 degrees, but to those on hand, what a beautiful day to play to. Oh, I always have fun. Always when I played, I had fun. Anybody can tell you that. Look out. Forget it. Oh, off the wall. Bobby Bonds with a double. And that's the first hit Joe Nuxall has ever given up in Riverfront. Knowing that Al Oliver had his share of hits at Riverfront, Gaylord Perry took his usual precautions. That is the ultimate spitball. Look at that thing. But the old spitter didn't fool Scoop. Oh, look out. Could be. It's gone. Home run, Al Oliver. Now, what's a pitcher to do after getting burned like that? Pure afternoon delight, especially for our young all-star shortstop watching an old pro. Johnny Biscuit Pickett, did. How do you feel, young man? I'm on your bag. What's your name? Very lucky. Nice to see you. Biggie Pickett, Danny. And so can you. From the old to the new, greetings from one all-star to another as this year's cast prepared for the main event. Secret weapon, Greeny's secret weapon, he's going to win the American League All-Star game this year with this bat right here. <laughs> off Todd Morwell. Dawson and Strawberry on the stuff. Great. I'm just glad to be on Roger Clemens' team at this time. <laughs> That's all I know. Coming here and, and it's all of a sudden like uh, it's my first big league game again. I have a chance to face the doc and everything, and I've never had a chance to face him. Just happy to be here. Carried my own bags in. It was a lot of fun. Fun, too, for Hall of Famers Bobby Doerr and Willie Stargell, this year's honorary captains. As for the game's honorary star, all eyes were on the unlikeliest all-star, Terry Steinbach. Well, you know, I was just going up there, you know, there was, there was so much excitement for me tonight, and uh, just went up there, and I was just going to see the ball and hit it hard, you know, just to try not to strike out. Here's a drive into right field, and back strawberry all the way back, and it's got of his glove and over the wall for a home run. Steinbach's third inning homer put the American League up one to nothing. Hardly what you'd expect from an unexpected starter. I took a lot of heat about that, you know, for about two, two to three weeks, and, and I was just going to come here and, and play hard, you know, like I said, all, all the way through this, and, and hope for the best. 12-time All-Star Dave Winfield helped the Americans' cause with a fourth-inning double that extended his All-Star hitting streak to a record-tying seven games. 
Winfield moved to third, and once again came the unexpected when Oakland catcher Terry Steinbach, en route to All-Star MVP, got another offer he couldn't refuse. This time, he hit a sacrifice fly to put the Americans ahead two to nothing. The Nationals scored a run in the fourth, but from then on, pitching and defense dominated. seventh inning, the Nationals threatened when Cincinnati's Chris Sabo came in to pinch run and then obliged the hometown crowd with a steal of second. With two on and a chance to tie the score, Andy Van Slyke was foiled by all-star defense. Clutch defense plus dandy pitching from the American League finished off the Nationals with a flourish. In the ninth inning, Dennis Eckersley, the Major League save leader with 26, put the finishing touches on the 2-1 victory. It was only the third win for the American League in the last 17 games, and all three of the victories came against teams managed by Whitey Herzog. As for the series overall score, Nationals 37, Americans 21, and one tie. Now let's tie up the answer to this week's quiz brought to you by Chevrolet. Hall of Famer Joe Cronin, who played for the Red Sox and Senators, started more All-Star games than any shortstop. Seven. That is unique. Everybody gets involved. It's a World Series atmosphere. There's the Finley Market Parade, which is a traditional event. It's just a very, very special day. Opening day may be special, but this year's All-Star Game was no doubt a thrill for Reds fans who saw three of their own make the team. Chris Sabo, the only rookie to be selected, was one of 31 players making their first All-Star appearance. Red shortstop Barry Larkin, who grew up in Cincinnati, was also picked to the National League squad for his first time. Also include Danny Jackson, the Reds' off-season acquisition, who ended the first half with nine wins. An impressive beginning for the newcomer who likes what he sees of Cincinnati baseball. The thing about these fans here, they're real knowledgeable about the, the game and what's going on, and uh, the real uh, into the all-star type players, you know what I mean, like Pete Rose. Uh, anything you have bad about Pete Rose, people don't like it around here, and I think that's a good thing for for young players to, to be a part of, uh, like Barry Larkin and uh, Chris Sable. You know, everything those guys do, these fans know about it and, and are into it. The people in Cincinnati love their baseball, and uh, it seems like during the season, that's all they talk about, you know, in the media is how the Reds are doing, if they're doing good or doing bad, but that's all they're talking about. You walk in the malls and people come up to you and say good luck, and, and uh, they just wish you well. They want, they want the, the Reds to do well here. Sabo's done so well at third, the Reds traded away veteran Buddy Bell. That's a strong vote of confidence for the rookie who plays a lot like his manager. Well, I see some similarities in myself and Chris, and I, I think the similarities are um, his love for the game, his enthusiasm to play the game, and the way he approaches the game. Uh, that's why he's leading the league in doubles right now. When he hits a single, he's not satisfied with single. He's thinking about a double. And that's the way to approach the game. I mean, uh, never be satisfied and take what the opposition will give you and then try to get more. The Reds couldn't be more pleased with Barry Larkin, who's playing shortstop just where he wants to be, home in Cincinnati. It was a great upbringing in Cincinnati. Uh, you know, the Reds have always been a big red machine in Cincinnati. And, you know, now it's my dream come true to play with the Reds here. Danny Jackson pitched for Kansas City in the 1985 World Series and would love nothing more than to do the same for the Reds. The only thing I'd like to do is re remain here as long as I can and, and to feel part of the tradition and feel part of the winning ways that they had before and, and to bring it back. 
uh, also like to bring them back to World Series and the playoffs that, that were once here at, uh, when they were a dynasty in the 70s. And, and those types of things are the things that I'm, I'm working for right now. With their dashing young all-stars, the Reds just may start going places. Just in case any of you were dozing off during the first half of the season, it's time now to rehash things. If anyone wanted to hide in the early going, it was Major League pitchers who were none too pleased when an old rule took on new meaning. Seventy-four box calls the first week of the season. Are we going to do it again? Uh, no. Oh, okay. Baltimore, going to the second time in history, have lost their first six in a row. That is 13 in a row. Until the Orioles win a game, we're still here. Obviously, it did not work out too well tonight. There's the stocking cap. Now everybody knows, Joe, you're in trouble. And there are the conads. You could say they're anti-cones, couldn't you? There are ways to beat the Heat. Yeah, you. Looking good. The Orioles lose their 16th in a row at the season's outset. My neighbor said, where are you going? And I said, well, I'm headed to Kansas City to see the Orioles play. And he said, what? Have you lost your head? Don't you say one word about this, you Oklahoma sod buster. This is tradition, my friends. And listen, this will end up in the Royal Brome Museum one of these days. Ladies and gentlemen, at 21, the streak is history. Hey, hey. <laughs> <laughs> are you working or are you? <laughs> what are you doing? It's no big deal. You know what I mean? It bothers hey. me. <laughs> I don't know about that. Here's the 1 1 to Sutcliffe. And a strike call. So the count is 1 and 2. Sutcliffe thought he was out on strikes. I think Ricky thinks that that's the third out. And finally he fires it back in. Ball for Dave Bergman. Did he strike out? Wait a second. Did he strike out or walk? Andres Thomas on the parry for out number two. That'll bring up Vaughn Hayes. A correction, out number three. Wait a minute. There are only two outs, folks. <laughs> Hold everything here. Hold everything. How can nine players out on the field all be confused about how many outs there are? Now Bernanski will get it over to left field. De Leon comes over to right. And we got a good hitting pitcher at the plate. A new pitcher for the Cardinals is their utility man, Jose Okendo. I don't know what Jose was trying to do there. Tonight, the lights went out in Georgia happens to be tonight. This looks like a scene out of a Humphrey Bogart movie. <laughs> Happy birthday. We're real happy uh, you. they don't want to last a week or so. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> so I am wasting time. I think we'll give that notion the old heave-ho and clear out of this mess as fast as we can. Time now to open the notebook for this week in baseball, Twib Notes from Around the Majors. Detroit's Sparky Anderson recently became the first manager to reach 800 wins in each league. By the way, Sparky's also the first manager to boast World Series championships in each league. I know that my grandchildren and my children, when I go, that is something they can always talk about. The first is the first. Nobody will ever be able to be first but me. Credit Nolan Ryan with win number 100 as an Astro. Earlier in his career, Ryan reached the century mark with the Angels, making him one of seven pitchers to win 100 games with two teams. Ryan also is 33 wins away from 300. The Giants put on a colossal hitting show in a game against St. Louis, collecting 21 runs, including this Ernest Wiles homer, one of five by San Francisco. He strikes again. What a mammoth blow. And a three-run homer for Ernest Riles, and it is 21-2 San Francisco. Wiles' blast marked the Giants' 10,000th home run in franchise history. Also in the game, Chris Fire collected five RBIs as he hit for the cycle for the second time in his career. As for the streaking Giants, they ended the first half with five straight wins to pull within two and a half games of first in the National League West. 
time now for our Player of the Week, brought to you by Gatorade Thirst Quencher. We salute Terry Steinbach, all-star MVP, whose surprising offense led the American League to victory. That's what I was thinking about, well, you know, what's the worst thing? One of the worst I can do is get probably two at bad strike out, you know, not throw anybody out, have about six pass balls, you know. <laughs> so that could be the worst. So first one out there, you know, with a, with a good attitude and, and was going out there to have fun and, uh, and, and just play the game the way it's supposed to be played. Bill McLean looks back to his remarkable 1968 season when he pitched the Detroit Tigers to a pennant and became the first pitcher in more than three decades to win 31 games. I'm Warner Fussell. That's all for now, folks. See you next week on This Week in Baseball.